All right. I think we will go ahead and get started. Um, Good afternoon, um, good morning, good evening, uh, depending on where you are uh, in the world. It's Mitchell Warren from AVAC and delighted uh, to welcome everyone um, to this webinar, um, which is um, uh, a really important one to complete a series that many of you, I think, are aware of. Some of you have been on uh, um, some, if not all five. Um, we, we, we aren't going to take um, tests here to see who, who joined all five, but we hope that many of you did. And if not, um, are aware that they are all available and archived uh, on the AVAC website, which I'll describe in just a moment. Um, but today, indeed, May 18th, um, is HIV Vaccine Awareness Day, and um, we're delighted to have this call on this day um, to really um, not only talk about where we are in the search for an HIV vaccine, but to really put it in the context of why um, it is so important to develop a vaccine um, and why it's not just a one-day event. Uh, um, and, and although we talk about it on May 18th, uh, we really hope that, that uh, um, the efforts and the information uh, that we'll talk about on this call are, are things that will evolve and be used throughout the year. Um, just to go through some quick logistics, um, I'm going to briefly introduce uh, uh, the call and, and uh, uh, the, just the way in which the morning and, or afternoon is going to go. I'm then going to turn it over to my uh, friend and colleague, Stacey Hanna, um, to do a bit of an overview around um, uh, a range of new materials and information, and then we will get in to a presentation, um, which, as you'll see on the slide if you're on ReadyTalk, um, does say um, an overview of vaccine development from the vaccine hunter, Nelson Michael, who uh, leads the U.S. Military HIV Research Program. Um, in addition to being a vaccine researcher, he's also a clinician and had to make clinical rounds and, and is not able to join us, but very happily, Julie Ake, who you'll hear from and be introduced to in just a moment um, from the MHRP is, is going to um, do an even better job than, than I think uh, Colonel Michael would have done, but don't tell him I said that. Um, having said that, um, this call is largely muted except for the presenters um, uh, because we want to keep the line clear and, and be able to post the recording, um, but we do want to encourage conversation and questions with Julie and with each other. Um, and I'll give some instructions at the end of the presentation uh, about how to unmute yourself and ask questions directly. But throughout the call, um, you can email us at avac at avac.org with any questions, um, or you can use the ReadyTalk chat feature, and we'll be sure to put those questions into the queue. Um, and, uh, and, and look forward to that conversation with everyone. Um, I, I, I do want to say that um, uh, May 18th, 2017 is now 20 years to the day that um, the President of the United States at the time, Bill Clinton, uh, made a commencement address at a college in Maryland called Morgan State um, and, and declared with um, a great deal of enthusiasm the importance of science generally and the importance of the development of an HIV vaccine. They actually called in 1997 that we think of the 21st century as, as the century of science and innovation, and that is a clarion call just as relevant in 2017 as it was in 1997. Um, and since that point and, and his desire to accelerate vaccine research, uh, um, it has been a, a driving force. And um, I, some of you will have been on the call just um, a couple of weeks ago with Barney Graham from the Vaccine Research Center, one of the um, Great outcomes of that speech in 1997 was the establishment at the NIH of the Vaccine Research Center, um, and uh, which has really pioneered a number of activities in partnership with a lot of organizations, including the Military HIV Research Program. So we're delighted to bring all of those pieces together on this webinar. But before we get to Julie and, and, and the overview and the presentation, um, I want to turn it over to Stacey Hanna, who many of you will know uh, directs research engagement at uh, AVAC and leads a number of activities, including um, our good participation practice initiative, which uh, many of you will know about, uh, how we ensure that all research, vaccine and otherwise, is done um, with, with uh, the best possible engagement of the widest number of stakeholders. Um, in addition to that, Stacy leads a program uh, that, that uh, we're very excited about at AVAC with a number of partners uh, called the Coalition to Accelerate and Support Prevention Research, where a lot of our effort is around increasing uh, research literacy and vaccine literacy. And I'm delighted to turn it over to Stacy um, first and foremost, to give you a quick sense of, uh, of Vaccine Awareness Day and advocacy in the current environment. All right. Thanks, Mitchell. Um, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Perfect. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> So yeah, thanks, and um, just thanks to everyone for, for being on the call. Um, it's been quite a lead up to May 18th um, this year, and so we're, we're really excited that, um, that we have everyone with us today. And, and we did, you know, as Mitchell said, we, um, 
we really wanted to sort of highlight some of the some of the things that we've been working on um, here at AVAC, but um, you know, in terms of uh, I think really helping to highlight what we feel are really kind of the important messages for for this year, 2017, which is um, the 20th anniversary of HFAD, but also is um, is a really important time in terms of both the vaccine research um, as well as kind of the advocacy that that's needed. Um, so. And I don't, I'm not going to take too much time, but just wanted to sort of go through some of um, some of the materials that, that we've developed and we've uh, we we sent out a couple of days ago um, in an email, so so everyone is is aware of of those. Um, okay, so this slide um, shows sort of the overview of this year the 2017 HVAD toolkit. Um, I think everybody knows that every year um, AVAC puts together a, a toolkit of um, materials to, to really just help break down the science and then also to kind of highlight what we feel are sort of key messages for, for the year in particular. Um, and this is really actually just a screenshot from our website that shows the, uh, the tools that are, that are here this year. Um, and then you see where you can access that um, pretty easy URL there, uh, avac.org slash HIV Vaccine Awareness Day, or you can even just type in HVAD um, and it'll get you there. Um, and I'm not going to go through all of these materials, but did just want to sort of highlight, and you know, a lot of work has really been put into to all of these kind of a basic fact sheet, um, and then a, 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 a sort of an introductory PowerPoint presentation that I think would be useful for probably for a lot of people on this this call, um, as well as, again, kind of the key messages and then some of the sort of busy advocates pieces where we really try to kind of break down, break down some of the, the scientific concepts. So hopefully um, people will take a look at those. And as always, we're very open to, to, to feedback if you see anything that is incorrect or anything that you would like to, to be changed there. Um, and I'm just going to sort of keep moving. One thing we really wanted to highlight, so this is sort of the focal piece for this year, um, the first piece listed there in the HVAD toolkit, um, a, a sort of a mini report um, called Advocacy in Uncertain Times and really a, a call to action around vaccine advocacy uh, for this year and, and for the time. Um, and I'm going to go through and actually just very quickly, I'm not going to talk in detail about these, but we really just sort of wanted to highlight um, some of the, especially some of the graphics that have been been included. Um, these are available on our website, so you'll see um, back at the the link I just showed you. There's a there's a link to the full report, but there's also a link to all the individual graphics that you can download in, um, I believe, JPEG or um, or PDF version. So hopefully they're they're ready avail readily available, and uh, hopefully people will will make good use of them. Um, the 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 report is is um, it's not a, a super you know intensive read, so I really encourage people to check it out. Um, and and there is there is quite a bit of text and, and commentary, kind of focusing on really kind of three key themes. So the first one being uh, political will and, and building on you know Bill Clinton's speech 20 years ago, and really making the call um, that you know we we're we're not going to have an end an end to the epidemic without a vaccine, and we're not going to have a vaccine without funding. Um, and that's kind of the first piece. And then we talk also about. Kind of the, the, really the, the the progress and the potential of the scientific field right now. So really highlighting, we're at a very exciting time um, in the vaccine field, and this is this is not a time to um, to you know to 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 minimize support for this field. Um, and so you see this, this is one of the first graphics. Um, as as AVAC does, we 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 talk a lot about financing. So this just sort of shows where we are right now and the fact that um, actually in recent years the funding has, has been a bit flatlined and, and, um, and you know, we need to make sure that the funding for, for this field really is, is maintained or even increased in, in years to come. 
Um, this is actually, this next one shows where we are with efficacy trials, and you'll hear, you've heard a lot about this in this webinar series. We're really at an exciting time again. Um, lots happening in the, the efficacy trials space in terms of vaccines, both um, with a couple of uh, preventive vaccine programs as well as with the antibody program. And I think everyone's familiar with, with those, and we'll, we'll be hearing more about, about pieces of that from, from Julie as well. Um, progress in terms of the number of vaccine trials that we've seen happen over the years. Um, in the middle of the report, there's a, there's a really nice center spread, and this is one piece of it, um, it, which I think is actually a super, super useful graphic. And this shows sort of the timeline of the, the efficacy trial space and really gives a lot of detail on where those different programs stand. Um, and, and you see the, 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 the three sort of key programs that, again, we've talked about a lot over the past month and, and people in the field are quite familiar with. So the P5 program there at the top and obviously a, a, um, a big focus on 702 and watching, watching that trial progress. Um, the ADD26 program being led by Janssen, and we'll also hear um, from a bit more of that from, from Julie today. And then obviously the, the, the AMP program looking at um, BRC01 and the, the proof of concept uh, trials that are underway currently and sort of where that program is, is, is going. Um, and then this is sort of the second piece of that center spread, which also also really highlights, and something we really highlight in terms of advocacy. It's not just about these efficacy trials. It's really about the full pipeline and some exciting um, approaches that are that are um, that are in earlier stages of clinical development, but but are really key to watch and key for advocates to be following and and supporting. Antibodies are a huge uh, huge focus and. Um, seems like you know there's a new antibody being discovered every day and and we as at AVAC and our you know certainly our advocacy partners are really interested in watching this space so what we've done here is um, is given sort of the current status of some key antibodies um, that are that are being uh, that are kind of in preclinical and clinical stages of, of research at the moment um, and then finally again you know there's a, there's a huge piece uh, in the report that talks about the potential and, and the, the progress of vaccine, vac the vaccine and kind of antibody space right now, um, and a, you know a, a really important sort of issue that that everyone is watching, and I and I think the the um, the trialists are really doing a lot to address is sort of where does oral prep fit in, um, and I think this is a really nice graphic that shows sort of this, the global status of oral prep rollout and how that maps onto where these efficacy trials are happening. Um, and then finally, I mean, one of, I think, really the key features of this piece, again, is sort of um, building on, you know, Bill Clinton being such a champion 20 years ago, and a lot of the champions that we've seen um, in the field throughout the past 20 years um, and, and, and today, um, and, and highlighting even some of, some of the new faces and some of the, the people that we've heard from in this webinar series, and, and really just calling, you know, for, for everyone to, to play a role in terms of champion, championing, championing for, for vaccine research. Um, and then finally, uh, you'll, I think you'll recognize there's sort of a, 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 a theme of P's. We talk about political will and progress and um, potential, and, and, and this last slide kind of highlights some of, some of those those pieces and what we feel are sort of the key messages for HIV Vaccine Awareness Day this year. And, and these actually link to the key messages document that I highlighted in the, the overview of the toolkit pieces. And that is, that's the overview. Mitchell, did, did I miss anything? No, just to get me off mute. That was brilliant. Um, uh, and these materials, as Stacy said, are all available at avax.org slash HVAD to download and use. And again, please tell us. We've already corrected a couple based on input even in the last day or two. So um, no, that was beautifully done, Stacy. Thank you. Great. Um, and we're happy to, and you know, people have questions, we're happy to even kind of take them during the Q&A section on, on this call as well. So um, we are always open to questions and criticism. So, um, so I am going to go ahead and turn it over to, to Julie Ake. Um, Mitchell did a bit of an introduction, and just to say um, we are really, really excited to have Julie joining us today to mark uh, May 18th. 
Julie is a lieutenant colonel in the in the U.S. Um, in the U.S. Army, and she's the principal deputy director of the U.S. Uh, MHRP program, and she'll be giving us um, sort of an overview of vaccine development from, from the MR MHRP side. So I'll hand it over to Julie. Thank you so much, Cece, and I really appreciated your presentation. It really is a privilege for me to be with this group on this important day, HIV Vaccine Awareness Day. Um, and so uh, I think you'll be advancing my slides for me, so if we could move to the next one, that would be great. Um, I'd like, always like to start to, um, uh, with a brief introduction to the U.S. Military HIV Research Program for those who may not be familiar or know that we've been around since 1986. Um, and our goal is to protect the U.S. military from HIV and improve global health by conducting research to develop an HIV vaccine, reduce new infections, and find a cure. Um, so we perform a pivotal role in HIV testing across our forces. Um, all of the work that we do informs policy and develops strategies to reduce HIV infections in the U.S. military. Um, importantly, where we do vaccine research, uh, we, especially in Africa, we support the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief. Um, and this is a really unique aspect of the work that we're able to do in communities uh, on the ground in um, East and Southern Africa and increasingly in West Africa. We've moved on to uh, work on the CURE agenda, and more recently we've been able to leverage our broad international network, basic science capabilities, um, and clinical trial infrastructure that we've developed for HIV to respond to emerging public health uh, threats to include Ebola and Zika. So I'm moving to the next slide. Um, and although MHRP really at its core is an HIV vaccine organization, uh, we've contributed substantively and focused substantively across the spectrum of uh, HIV research. And it's so important, in our view, uh, to break down silos and to work across the spectrum because all of us working in these different areas of HIV research have so much to learn from one another. And so a few things to highlight, um, and certainly this slide is available for those who are interested in the details, are um, on the prevention side, obviously the RV144 study that showed the first positive uh, clinical trial efficacy result for HIV vaccines um, is the, the highlight of the work that we've done and are continuing to build on in the prevention space. Uh, and on the treatment side, our work in PEPFAR as well as uh, work uh, um, in treatment populations looking at comorbidities um, and developing vaccines for therapy are part of our treatment agenda. Moving on into HIV remission, um, where uh, U.S. military HIV research program investigators uh, characterized early infection in a groundbreaking cohort of Thai and East African volunteers. This is RV217. We'll talk about that a little bit more um, later, um, and we've learned a lot about very early HIV infection, which of course we want to um, interrupt with the vaccine, um, but also perhaps use as an opportunity to uh, intervene with cure strategies. And we found that intervening just with early ART dramatically reduces HIV DNA set point. Um, and so that HIV DNA, which is a marker of the reservoir, which is the barrier to cure, um, as opposed to just um, traditional uh, HIV RNA set points, we're all familiar with that. So um, I, I think it's important to emphasize that, you know, as we focus on HIV vaccines, that field can inform the spectrum of uh, HIV research, and we are happy to be substantively involved uh, across that spectrum. Moving on to the next slide, um, to spend a little bit of time on RV144, um, because that really has been so pivotal um, and, and re reinvigorating to the field. Uh, this was the Thai HIV vaccine study that was published in 2009 that enrolled 16,000 volunteers in Thailand. Um, and this was the first HIV vaccine uh, on a pox protein platform to show, and the first HIV vaccine at all, to show modest effectiveness in preventing HIV in humans. And so it was actually effective um, up to 60% at year one. Um, however, the predefined study endpoint was at three and a half years, where it was only 31.2% um, effic um, efficacious. So 
this was not a favorable enough result to lead to licensure of the product, but it certainly showed that a preventive vaccine is possible, and we've learned a lot about correlates of risk um, and uh, immune responses to HIV in this popula population that can um, uh, inform future vaccine development. Moving on to the next slide, some of the ways that we're building on the success of 144 um, has been to capitalize on the available uh, results of the trial, um, working with over 120 international scientists uh, to, dis to evaluate correlates of risk. And we found some very important ones. Um, the key uh, correlate of risk, um, specifically of decreased risk, is we found that those individuals who produced certain antibodies to a segment of the envelope, V1, V2 region of the envelope, had a decreased risk of HIV acquisition in the trial. Um, subsequently, many other correlates have been described. This is one of the leading correlates, and we certainly are very interested to see how new vaccine regimens coming out um, fare in terms of the responses they produce in this assay. Um, this, uh, all of this has informed vaccine regimens for future testing, and of course, HVTN702 is the POX protein platform from RV144 reformulated for a subtype C epidemic. And so we are thrilled to see that study off and running um, and, and, and look forward uh, to the readout from that study. Um, as, uh, as that on is ongoing, we're looking at results from two follow-on uh, studies that we conducted in um, Thailand with interest. Um, one of them is RV305. Yes. Um, oh, sorry. You, um, if you just look at, um, uh, sorry, the next slide is um, building on success of RV144, um, and this is where it goes into RV305 and 306. And RV305 um, evaluates um, the reboosting of those same volunteers uh, five to seven years later. Um, it's really remarkable what the sites have been able to do to bring, uh, bring those volunteers back years later, really very committed volunteers and site staff. Um, and they've been able to um, bring, back those, bring back a subset of volunteers for reboosting, looking at different components of the boost and different boosting intervals. And then this was formally explored um, with a set of naive volunteers in RV306, repeating the RV144 regimen and then looking at different boosting intervals. Um, and so all of those have helped us to understand what's important in terms of boosting strategies for our subsequent trial designs. And so um, what can we do to keep that 60% efficacy maintained over a long period of time by additional boosting? And I think we're learning a lot from those studies. Um, and so that, that informs uh, subsequent MHRP studies which in this regional approach, we're really focusing on subtype B infection. I'll go ahead and move to the next slide. Um, and so our pox protein work, in collaboration with many others in the field, has been largely focused on a regional approach. Um, and so the initial regional approach in Thailand focused on subtypes B and CRF01 um, AE, which circulates there, and of course subtype B in the US and Europe. Um, and then HVTN702 is focused on subtype C. Um, our other effort, in addition to this regional pox protein strategy, has been to pursue a next generation of vaccines that could provide global protection. Because although most of our soldiers who acquire HIV infection acquire subtype B infection, our ultimate goal is to develop a vaccine that you can shoot into the arm of the soldier and protect, you know, protect that soldier or warfighter wherever you deploy them around the world. Um, and so several strategies are being pursued uh, in that vein. Um, one is uh, looking at uh, multi-clade DNA, MVA, uh, uh, um, prime boost regimens um, in collaboration with uh, Karolinska um, as well as um, NIAD LVD. Um, and, uh, Another, um, which is very exciting and promising, and I think the, this group would have heard a lot from Maria Grazia Pau about the Janssen AD26-based um, 
based vaccine regimen. Um, some of the arms that are being evaluated in that regimen include the MVA developed by MHRP. Um, and uh, that is a very exciting regimen that is going forward for prevention. We'll talk about that a little bit too, but it's also being applied in the therapeutic vaccine setting. Um, and, uh, um, and we see how um, leveraging the work we're doing in prevention can be applied for therapeutic vaccine candidates. This is an important collaboration, not just with Janssen, but also Beth Israel, Deaconess Medical Center, Dan Baruch, and um, who's at BIDMC, as well as um, NIAD, which is a strong supporter of the program. I think we could go ahead and move to the next slide, which describes a little bit more uh, the Janssen Mosaic uh, prevention strategy, which is to combine the vectors that elicit optimal immune responses. Um, so highly immunogenic AD26, which is a rare serotype AD vector, um, as well as MVA, um, uh, and combining those with mosaic inserts into those vectors that are designed um, to achieve global coverage. And so that's what I was talking about earlier, um, a vaccine that, um, that administered uh, to one of our soldiers or hopefully to one of, um, you know, another individual who um, may be at risk for HIV infection um, to, uh, to, you know, that they could then be protected against all circulating subtypes. And I think that with in increasing international travel, um, increased recombination of the virus, the future is really in the development of these global strategies. Um, and then, of course, we see um, the importance of antibody protection seen at least in RV144, um, and therefore the inclusion of a protein in this regimen is also key. Um, moving on to the next slide, um, that same prevention regimen uh, is being looked at uh, on the therapeutic side. And one particularly interesting uh, um, combination is looking at AD26 uh, prime boost vaccines in the context of administration of a TLR7 agonist, um, which uh, in this study in non-human primates actually showed a reduced viral load in monkeys after ART discontinuation. And so this was a very exciting uh, preclinical study which uh, the collaborators on this study, um, of which we are one, um, are moving forward to uh, move into clinical trial designs. That is very early stages, but I think, uh, I, I think an important example of how, uh, how work that we do on the prevention side can translate to breakthroughs on the therapeutic side as we move towards uh, contributing to the cure agenda. If you take a look at the next slide, it's the um, uh, slide that describes our acute infection studies. And so um, taking a look at acute HIV infection, as I said earlier, is something that we want to do to understand what are the events that we want to interrupt with a vaccine. Um, and that was the original impetus for MHRP to be working in very early acute HIV infection. Um, and so before the cure study, the cure agenda um, was, I you know, popularized with and, and the collaboratories were formed. We were working in these acute infection studies and developing these cohorts, which really are like nothing else in the world. Um, RV217 is a prospective acute um, infection study in individuals who are at high risk for HIV infection, um, and that is ongoing in East Africa and Thailand. Um, thus far that they've um, tested over 2,276 um, individuals. And so um, this, uh, the study teams at, this, um, at the sites for this study actually work with the volunteers to see them twice weekly. Um, and they can, they're able to catch HIV infection at the very earliest stages and describe it um, in ways that had only been characterized previously by a small handful of infections. Um, and so uh, they've, you know, uh, characterized over 115 acute HIV infections with that cohort. Uh, also, the RV254 cohort, which is, which is enrolling in Bangkok, Thailand, that's led by Jintanat and Warnich, 
she um, leads a, a group that performs real-time screening um, of individuals who come in for anonymous testing at the Thai Red Cross Anonymous Testing Center in Bangkok. And they have screened over 200,000 individuals um, looking for acute HIV infection um, and have found over 450 and enrolled into uh, this study um, and uh, it have enrolled over 100 individuals who are at the very, very earliest stages of HIV infection. And then they are um, enrolled into a subsequent study. The vast majority choose to be enrolled in a subsequent study that allows them to be treated very early in um, an acute HIV infection. And this is the cohort that has produced the results showing that there is much lower seeding of the reservoir when uh, antiretroviral therapy is introduced as early as possible. Moving on to the next slide. This is just a description um, of the therapeutic vaccine study, which is ongoing with um, in the RV254 cohort with Dr. Annan Warnage. Um, so individuals who are in RV254 and treated very early have the option of enrolling into various uh, therapeutic interventions aimed at evaluating cure strategies. And one of them is the AD26 um, MVA therapeutic vaccine. Um, and so those individuals are administered the vaccine um, and, then, uh, and then their therapy is interrupted and they are monitored very, very closely um, and uh, at the time of any rebound are resumed. Um, and so all of these vaccinations are complete in this particular study and we're looking for the readout at the ATI. And I think an absolutely key part of the work that we do when we are working with these populations that give so much to the research process uh, in terms of um, being available during, during, a, during the time of their HIV infection um, and diagnosis is that um, we conduct parallel social, behavioral, and ethics research along with this work. And I think that this is going to be very informative for the subsequent conduct of uh, HIV cure trials. The next slide um, shows MHRP and PEPFAR. Um, and this is work that we began doing in 1999 as um, uh, uh, we began working in Africa in 1999 for HIV vaccine work. And then as PEPFAR began, we had the opportunity to participate. And we saw this as a fantastic way to give back to the communities that were giving so much to us and providing research participants and, 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 and hosting our, our, our researchers uh, and working with us to do HIV vaccine research on the continent. Um, and so for us, we found that this had ensures an ethical framework for clinical research. It engages civilian and military populations in, in Kenya, Nigeria, Tanzania, and Uganda. Um, and we find this to be a sustainable approach that develops capacity and fosters ownership at the sites. We've also found that both the research activities and the PEPFAR activities where we work have helped to build an infrastructure and relationships that have enabled research on other emerging diseases. And a good example for that is that our site in Nigeria, which was established through PEPFAR, um, had been conducting observational HIV research for some time. And at the time of the Ebola epidemic, um, we were able to, in six months, stand up a clinical trial center because the um, existing clinical, clinical research expertise, laboratory expertise had been there and established through the combination of uh, PEPFAR provision and HIV research that had been ongoing. And so that um, clinical trial center has contributed now to two different um, vaccine platforms for Ebola, which is, of course, very relevant to uh, West Africa. Um, the next slide uh, goes on to discuss a little bit about HIV in Nigeria. And I wanted to use this opportunity um, to highlight uh, um, highlight West Africa and HIV because I think that the majority of the field that is focused on Africa is has their eye on East Africa and Southern Africa. Um, 
and Nigeria is the most populous African country with over 180 million individuals. And 9% of all persons living with HIV worldwide live in Nigeria because of the size of that population. Only South Africa has more people living with HIV in it. And 10% of all new infections worldwide occur in Nigeria as well, um, as 14% of all AIDS-related deaths, which is actually more than any other country in the world, which I think shows um, some of the gaps that exist there in terms of care for HIV and prevention. I think moving on to the next slide, um, we have been thrilled to be working with the Institute for Human Virology at the University of Maryland um, to uh, evaluate populations that are at increased risk for HIV in Nigeria. Um, and so we have been working um, in a way that reflects the dual MHRP mission to promote HIV prevention, care, and treatment, as well as research, um, to do a, a, a cohort study um, that focuses on risk of MSM for HIV and other STIs um, called the TRUST study. And so this study is enrolling in Abuja, which is the nation's capital in north central Nigeria and the mega city of Lagos. And we have found in this group of individuals um, uh, that HIV prevalence at enrollment is eye-poppingly high, 46% in Abuja, 70% in Lagos. Um, and then in the study, which uses respondent-driven sampling, um, we've documented an incidence in Lagos um, early. This is, this is the preliminary incidence before the end of the study, but thus far um, it is um, over 20%. Um, and that is I think indicative of the um, health-seeking issues and the extreme risk that is faced by this population, which is very stigmatized in Nigeria. Um, and indeed, we've shown through the study the adverse impact of um, anti-MSM um, laws that have been passed in Nigeria, well, one in particular, um, and before and after differences in healthcare-seeking behavior. Um, We've also seen that there are very high rates of chlamydia and gonorrhea in this population, and almost, or and most of that is really at extragenital sites, which would never be screened um, unless uh, the clinics are, um, are are literate and educated in taking care of MSM populations at risk for STIs. So I think the study has really um, started to highlight health service provision gaps, um, and also. Uh, the incidence of HIV in this stigmatized population in Nigeria um, it really, I think, is, to, to use a word that was um, used early in the call, a clarion call, um, for paying attention to HIV in Nigeria as a field. It's time we cared. Um, I think we should um, go ahead and move to the next slide. Uh, Ebola research in Africa is something that we've been able um, and, and happy to participate in leveraging our existing HIV network and really working with a lot of the same collaborators that we know well from HIV vaccinology. Um, people may not know, but the U.S. military through the Military HIV Research Program actually conducted the first Ebola vaccine clinical trial on the continent of Africa back in 2009. It was the NIH Vaccine Research Center's DNA candidate. Um, we're currently working with them to test um, their CHIMPAD3 vaccines um, and also um, follow on phase two sponsored by GSK, as well as uh, the Janssen, um, Johnson & Johnson Add26 MVA Ebola platform. And in that case, the uh, Ebola, I mean, sorry, the MVA vaccine is provided by Bavaria Nordique. It's not the one that the, the U.S. military developed, um, but we are very happy to uh, be in the midst of a large um, phase two trial with this product uh, that began in the U.S. Um, and then is enrolling at six different sites in Africa that have all been developed for HIV vaccines but are leveraged here. And we very specifically um, have targeted enrollment to enroll half of the volunteers um, that are HIV infected. So half the enrollment population will be an HIV infected population. And we find that we think it's very important to understand the immune responses um, in HIV-infected individuals to this vaccine, which when it was rolled, when it is rolled, if it, you know, God forbid, should it have to be rolled out in a wide fashion on the African continent, 
um, it, it, there would certainly be people um, at risk um, for Ebola infection that would be candidates for receiving a vaccine that would be HIV infected. And so what kind of immune responses can we expect? Can we expect that it might work in those individuals? Well, um, this study is, as far as I know, the biggest phase two um, study in terms of enrolling HIV infected uh, individuals. So I think moving on, um, the Joint West Africa Research Group is uh, building on the work that we've done in Ebola to reach out to our colleagues in the Navy um, who, um, as we have worked for a long time in Nigeria, have a long-standing um, detachment in Ghana and um, had worked uh, very um, in a side-by-side -side fashion during the, uh, the Ebola epidemic in Liberia with some investigators. Um, and, and, and really just laboratorians trying to respond to the epidemic in Monrovia. Um, and so the goal of this group uh, is to prevent an emerging infectious disease surprise in West Africa and advance our um, medical research mission while um, addressing needs that are relevant to host nation public health as well. Um, and ultimately, uh, in learning many of the lessons and applying a lot of the expertise that we've developed uh, with the rollout of a clinical trials network for HIV, um, being able to have a platform to evaluate diagnostics, vaccines, and therapeutics um, in, in West Africa should enable us to leverage the work that we've done in HIV to address emerging, uh, emerging vaccines or emerging uh, health threats. I think moving on to the next slide. Uh, another example of where um, HIV and other existing research infrastructure was heavily leveraged for emerging infectious diseases threats, because I understand it's of interest to the group to hear the link between the two, um, has been the RARE's effort in developing um, the purified and activated vaccine for Zika. And so this is a tried and true method of formalin inactivation, a method that should produce a product with a favorable profile for pregnant women. Um, and uh, after the first case of Zika was identified in the United States in November 2015, by February, our bioproduction facility started production of this vaccine product. Um, and working with our collaborator, Dan Baruch, who we work with very closely for HIV, um, we showed that this vaccine provided 100% protection in mice. Moving on to July, um, we partnered with Sanofi Pasteur, who was our, one of our commercial partners for RV144, um, to scale up um, production and, and essentially for technology transfer for subsequent advanced development. Um, in August, uh, we worked with collaborators to demonstrate 100% protection in monkeys, and then in November began a human phase one clinical trial here at RARE. And, um, there are actually four studies ongoing, soon to be five, uh, evaluating this product um, in the phase one setting. Uh, so I think um, that is a good example of how all of the expertise in vaccine development that has been uh, enhanced so much by the HIV vaccine field can then respond rapidly and effectively to, some might say, an easier virus, Zika. Moving on to the next slide, which is my last, it's just a note about ensuring future success. I think what we're seeing now in the HIV field is a new level of collaboration and partnerships and a new generation of researchers that it's not the old boys club. Um, it's a group of collaborative individuals, a group of international individuals um, who are impatient, who understand that we cannot march on year after year with the staggering number of deaths and morbidity that we see associated with HIV vaccines. Um, and we're learning that it's important to break down silos and leverage prevention and treatment research. And a good example of that is um, developing vaccines for prevention, but also evaluating their role in the therapeutic setting. Um, and for us all to understand HIV as a public health threat that requires sustained and intensity of effort. The Ebola epidemic, and that's something um, that we were very and continue to be very involved in responding to and developing countermeasures for here at the RARE. The Ebola epidemic resulted in the deaths of just under 12,000 individuals. That was a tragedy. 
HIV results in the deaths of over 20,000 individuals in a week. So whereby, uh, I don't need to tell this group, <laughs> you know, that, you know, whereas the world was shocked by the intensity and the tragedy of the Ebola epidemic, 12,000 people in the HIV world, that's just Wednesday. And then the next, <laughs> and in the next week, by the next Wednesday, that will be another 12,000 people. It's more than an Ebola epidemic every single week. Um, and none of us can lose track of this. The field can't lose track of this. The next generation certainly has not. Um, and I think that uh, it'll take all of us to continue to press that message. Uh, and so I would end uh, with a quote from my boss, Colonel Michael, the vaccine hunter, um, uh, which is that while we have many prevention tools available to help curb the epidemic, we need a safe, globally effective vaccine to end it. In the end, it will take a vaccine, and we are very optimistic that working together we'll get there. Um, so with that, uh, I'd be happy to take any questions, and also I know that my colleagues from AVAC uh, had um, some very important points to make in their earlier presentation, and I suspect they would appreciate the chance to engage in dialogue about that as well. Great. Thank you so much, Julie. Um, that was jam-packed, but, um, but just super enlightening. And I think um, for me, you know, in terms of HIV Vaccine Awareness Day, um, actually got me thinking about some things that, that, um, that I don't often think about in terms of uh, the comparison to other disease areas as well as sort of the, the geographical scope that you talked about. So. Um, so that was that was great, and I'm I loved your comment about the old, old boys club. And just to reiterate, we're so glad to to have you on this call. Um, one one thing, so we're gonna we're gonna do um, a bit of a Q and A session before we hit the top of the hour. Um, I do really want to encourage people to, um, you know, in the in the effort to to hear lots of voices and get lots of voices engaged in this conversation, to to go ahead and pipe up and ask a question if you have one for Julie or for Avac. Um, star seven to unmute your line, um, and then star six to mute again. Um, but maybe I'll just pause for a second if, if anyone would like to do that to kick off. Great. Um, well, feel, feel free to just jump in and interrupt us anytime. <clears throat> we do have a number, of, a lot of people actually on the line, which is great. Um, and as, as per usual, we've had a number of questions sort of come in during the call. And so I will just, I'll kick those off and um, Mitchell and I will sort of co-facilitate co a bit. So um, Julie, I, I guess a number of questions sort of about kind of the geographical scope. Um, and you talked a lot about um, RV144, the success of that trial, and how you know it's really been a hallmark for the vaccine field, as we all know, um, and just a really important study that happened in Thailand. So, I mean, so one specific question about um, about Thailand and sort of, you know, what are the um, what are what are the efforts being made to to develop a vaccine for for Thailand and for other countries in that region? And sort of what are what's the kind of you know trajectory there? What's the, what is the MHRP or the, sort of the field more broadly kind of thinking about the the future there and building on RV144 in addition to sort of um, the pieces that that you talked about that will inform vaccine development, but specifically for that region. Um, and then. Kind of linked to that, maybe sort of a, a, a broader question in terms of, um, you know, what is the, the HRP sort of broader rationale around testing kind of different clade specific strategies in different geographical regions of, of the world? Um, and you, you did mention that the MHRP will have sort of a focus on clade B. So, what's sort of the rationale there, kind of especially in terms of the, the Mosaic program and really thinking about kind of a global vaccine um, that, would, that would really work against uh, all clades? Thank you so much for those questions, uh, very good ones. Um, and so with regard to developing a vaccine for the Thai epidemic, we remain committed to working with our Thai partners in an efficacious vaccine, um, develop, uh, development of an effective vaccine for that 
a region of the world. Um, and actually, both the regional and the global strategies we're pursuing are relevant. And so the RV-144 regimen involved a boost with um, a, both a B protein and a subtype E protein. And it appears that the subtype E protein, which was A244, um, and E is the, is the subtype that is circulating in Thailand, um, that that had some very uh, important antigenic properties that allow for cross-clade activity. And so, um, and so we think that's a core part of the RV-144 regimen that we will be maintaining um, even as we shift the, a lot of the regional focus um, to including elements that are um, efficacious for subtype B in the regimen. So the B protein that was used in the boost for RB144 was an MN protein, appeared to not be very immunogenic. So we think it's really important for developing a vaccine that's relevant for subtype B populations to improve um, on that uh, subtype B component of the boost. Um, but we'll be retaining the A244 subtype E, and therefore um, in the buildup towards uh, developing this uh, reformulated uh, regional regimen, we are uh, performing ongoing incidence cohorts in Thailand. Um, two of those four sites have already kicked off, um, and opening one in Germany for the subtype B. Um, so I think that Thailand remains a very core part of our uh, regional strategy, even though um, we are placing more emphasis on subtype B now that we understand um, uh, that really is the lion's share of infections in soldiers. Um, and the other uh, uh, main pillar of the work that we do is development of global. And so it, we, it's really not an either or, you know, regional or global vaccine. We're focusing on both approaches. The problem is too big to only have one iron in the fire. So these are being pursued in parallel and, of course, in collaboration with different groups across each effort. And the, um, the global vaccine uh, and, and our work with Janssen and the mosaic approach we think is very promising. Um, and the down selection study is ongoing um, to select the specific regimen. Um, and uh, it's been safe and very well tolerated thus far. Um, and I think we'll start to see some of the early immunogenicity coming out. Um, and I think things are looking very favorable for moving to a proof of concept study um, for that regimen as well. And so we think it's a very exciting time for the field to see um, with, you know, first HVTN moving out for a regional, in this case subtype C um, uh, approach, um, and the work that we're starting to do to refocus on subtype B retaining the subtype E relevant um, portions of the vaccine, um, at least of the boost. Um, you know, at the same time that we see this mosaic approach moving forward. Um, I, I just think it's a, a promising time in the field. Mm. Um, yeah, super helpful. Um, that, that's, that's, a, that's great, great to sort of hear, hear, hear the rationale there. Um, so another sort of um, big, big set of questions, and I'm just kind of looking at the time and trying to group things together, um, but actually a pr pretty simple one. I mean, you know, one thing that we really kind of wanted to hear from you all at MHRP is sort of about this new focus, or not new, but um, kind of the, the, the work that you've done around sort of Ebola and, and Zika um, vaccine development. And obviously this is something, and I, I loved your point at the end about sort of the, the comparison, but it's something that the world has really been, been watching and something, you know, that is a kind of a very layperson question that, that we've been sort of kicking around here at AVAC is, is there, can you sort of explain in kind of lay terms why it seems to be so much easier to, to kind of move through vaccine development and to, and to sort of quote unquote find, find success um, in vaccine development for these sort of emerging pathogens, the Ebola, the Zika, um, as opposed to HIV vaccine research where we're just, um, you know, kind of trucking along and it seems to be very challenging. Is there sort of a way to explain that in simple terms? Well, I guess it would just be that. I, you know, and I heard someone say once that all the easy vaccines have been made already. Um, and, mm -hmm. you know, but um, I actually don't agree with that. I think the easy vaccines that had a clear um, market with potential for profit have been made already. Um, and so um, as uh, 
um, you know, more straightforward viruses with a clear target, for instance, the, you know, the glycoprotein of the Ebola vaccine, um, uh, of the Ebola virus that is then, you know, used as the insert in Ebola vaccine candidates. Um, you know, it, I, I guess I would just say that um, sometimes the virus that the vaccine is being made against um, has a, a more constant um, available target um, that uh, that can be developed, you know, um, into an insert readily um, mm -hmm. for a vaccine. Um, and HIV, as um, all of us know, um, has is it, it, very difficult. The targets um, are often shielded on the surface of the virus. Um, the envelope, which is the outside of the virus that the immune system sees, is being is is very uh, diverse, and there is a lot of ongoing mutation of the virus. Um, and so it is, I think, a harder and smarter bug, <laughs> frankly, mm -hmm. than uh, Zika and Ebola, um, uh, if, if that is a clear enough description from my perspective. I think, yeah, I think that's very very simple and, and, and clear, so, so thank you. Um, I'm actually, I'm going to hand over to Mitchell just in our last um, few minutes. Mitchell? Great. Well, thank you, and Julie, some great, uh, great presentation and great questions. A, a bunch more have come in. I'm going to try to get to them quickly. I know we're near the top of the hour, but I see people are still there, so we'll take advantage of that and take advantage of, of having you. So one came in, which is a great question. I know it's dogged this field for decades. Of course, we most want a vaccine for everybody at risk, and we know very much that adolescents are at greatest risk. And someone asked a great question, how many vaccine trials have enrolled adolescents? Um, some of us know the answer to that. Um, and, and so you could take that on, but also talk about, well, what, what's next in, if we want a vaccine for adolescents under the age of 18? What should we be doing? That's a great question. And um, for all of the major efficacy efforts that are going forward right now, and I know specifically for um, HVTN702 and for the Janssen platform, um, there are um, already um, planned bridging studies to adolescents in their development track. Um, and so uh, th that is, um, I think, something that is uh, very much on the minds of individuals leading the development, the development of these products. Um, and also, even further than the bridging studies, thinking about how do you roll them out in adolescence. For girls, do you roll it out with the HPV vaccine is, um, is I think, a very you know, important consideration. So um, I think that the field is, um, you know, at the time that candidates are moving towards efficacy studies, uh, planning for bridging studies in adolescents, but also thinking about eventual public health rollout. Great. Now, that is fantastic. Let me ask you also, I mean, you spoke eloquently about community engagement, particularly when you were talking about Nigeria. And, of course, MHRP has worked in, in a number of different countries and regions of the world. And, and a question came in about um, how uh, MHRP is standardizing that, if you're standardizing it, um, and, and what, what is maybe different about MHRP um, today in terms of how you all think of engagement with the range of communities compared to perhaps when you all started? Um, and I might also uh, take advantage of, of, of asking that to, to Stacy as well in terms of some of the engagement approaches. So, but Julie, um, a thought from MHRP? Thanks so much, Mitchell. Uh, community engagement is really, has to be at the core of any vaccine research agenda. Um, and I think we've only learned that more over time. Um, I think one thing that we've learned in terms of communication um, at the places that we're working uh, at, at, um, and conducting clinical trials um, is that, uh, is that we're, for us, not just engaging the community and having cabs, but working in the communities to provide service, to actually take care of people with HIV, to provide testing, um, to you know, work in the antenatal setting, um, to prevent mother-to-child transmission, to actually being engaged in a project in the community outside of research, I think has, is maybe one thing that differentiates MHRP, but it's also something that has helped us to understand the communities more, um, just as our organizations, which will have the director of research in an office next to the director of the, of the HIV you know, care program, um, you know, as, as they interact and, and can learn from, 
one another. So I, I think that's critically important. Um, and are we approaching it differently than we did um, uh, maybe as it all came out? Um, so I must admit I wasn't there <laughs> when it started. But, um, but even in the time, the seven years that I've been at MHRP, I've only seen a, a, growing, a, grow, a growing focus. And I think it's something that we can always learn how to do better. And Mitchell, I guess I'll just jump in really, really quickly. Um, and and just I think from the um, the the kind of perspective of the good participatory practice guidelines, and you know, I think the. <clears throat> First of all, sort of the strong support I think that has always been there from from MHRP in terms of you know GPP in and of itself, um, but also just in terms of you know I think what Julie talked about. Um, you know I think so often you really do see kind of a, a community engagement approach being so specifically linked to the conduct of, of trials and linked to, to trial outcomes, which is absolutely, you know, right and, and you know, community engagement for, for research should be about advancing the research. But I think, Julie, you're at this point of making it broader, um, really doing something that is, is not necessarily linked to a research agenda but is actually partnering with the community is, um, is I think, an approach through sort of GPP global kind of, you know, implementation um, is something that we've seen as being, you know, super successful. Um, and I guess the one other thing to note where I really see MHRP playing a role, and, and just to say, you know, Nelson, Nelson Michael has always been such a, a champion of GPP and just this real need to have the backing of, um, of, of stakeholders, um, is also the, the focus on uh, GPP and community engagement in kind of this emerging pathogen area. Um, and actually an effort that has been underway through the WHO that I know um, Colonel Michael has been, been involved with to develop actually a GPP for, um, Ebola, for emerging pathogen research, so looking at Ebola and Zika trials. And a lot of effort, I think, um, and, and I think advocacy from the MHRP side um, that has gone into to ensuring that we're, we're kind of learning lessons across these various fields and really making this a robust practice across um, clinical research globally. So just wanted to sort of put in, put in that plug. <laughs> great. Now, thank you both, Julie and Stacey. Those are great replies. And I think it is an evolving uh, art and science. And I think we're all, whether advocates or researchers, uh, uh, policymakers, communities doing this together. Um, I, I know we're at the top of the hour just passed, but other questions came in. I, I, I want to make sure to answer one because it comes from – there may be others on the line, but I know there's at least one person on the line who was working in this field when – uh, President Clinton uh, made his speech in May of 1997, and you know the, the good news is, that in, in the report that Stacy showed you, we saw you also saw, saw photos of a number of investigators and advocates who um, are young and youthful and weren't around in 1997 working in HIV. Uh, but one, and I'll just name him, is Jose Esparza, who um, was not just an early researcher, but was probably the earliest and greatest, and still is uh, greatest HIV vaccine advocate. But he asked a great question um, about Europe. Um, and I just wanted to put this up in terms of European funding and, and how do we not only get Europeans to invest more, but a global commitment to this resource issue. And I've just put back up the slide that Stacy showed earlier of the funding, and it looks fantastic 20 years later to go from 186 million to 841 million. Um, but in the context of vaccine development and in the context of the AIDS response, this is still um, limited uh, resources for an, a, a massively important endeavor. And, um, and I do want to just say, and in the slide deck that's available to download, there's a, a, the final slide of the Vaccine 101 is a list of um, other organizations working in HIV vaccines. And, and two of them are new this year on the list, and they're both European consortia that were funded by the European Commission. So you'll see in the... Um, kind of uh, lavender color. Europe is $54 million in 2016. Um, that is, is basically quite a significant increase over past years through two consortia. Um, but it's still, as you can see, quite a small amount relative to what you see MHRP or USAID and let alone the NIH. So um, there is advocacy that is needed. And I think uh, you know, we can look at HIV Vaccine Awareness Day in lots of different ways. It's about recognizing 
the thousands, tens of thousands of people who've participated historically and will participate in future trials, and today's a day to recognize and honor them. It's to recognize and honor the research community for what they bring in, 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 in the science. Um, it's also a, a, a recommitment that we need um, to maintain advocacy, not just in the U.S., not just in Europe, in South Africa, in Kenya, in Nigeria, in Uganda, and I could go down the list. Um, uh, but, but, Jose, it's a, it's a great question, and, and, um, and, and we, we, we can't possibly rest uh, um, uh, in, until. Um, and, and so that's just a, a, a quick response. And I, I will say there are um, a number of efforts, uh, and one that I think we're really excited about at AVAC um, uh, that I just want to highlight, and it's mentioned in the report online, is a, a relatively new group, the Vaccine Advocacy Resource Group, the VARG, um, uh, that is made up of advocates from um, uh, about a dozen countries where vaccine research is happening, including in Europe. And I will say that we're excited at AVAC to be able to partner with the VARG because we see that as the, the real next generation of vaccine advocacy. Um, and they just had an in-person meeting a few weeks ago in Nairobi, and it is thrilling to see um, new advocates coming into this space uh, um, and, and growing that space. And, and um, we look really forward to, to great things. And already today, three different uh, articles have been written and published by VARG members for Vaccine Awareness Day, so the voices are multiplying, and I think that's at least one response, uh, Jose, to, to that. Um, I, maybe I'll just pause. Um, just I realize, again, it's past the top, but and any other final questions from anyone? Um, star 7 to unmute your line, and star 6 to, to remute. All right. Um, I will say that, as Stacy said at the outset, um, all of the materials, um, not just the new report, but the graphics and the, this rec recording of this webinar, as well as the slide, someone asked a question, the slides that both Julie and Stacy gave us uh, today will be online uh, shortly along with the recording, as well as the other four calls in the series that focused on some of these issues in a bit more detail. All of that um, will be available uh, online and in, in for, for the archives at AVAC org slash HVAD and all the materials that um, uh, um, that, that are there and, and I just wanted to, to close um, uh, you know it, it is just a day May 18th it is um, no more important a day than the day before or the day after um, Julie really beautifully described the fact that um, the number is 12,000 uh, we it, it's like an Ebola epidemic every week and you know the same number of people were infected and living with HIV and on treatment yesterday as today actually we'll have more people infected but hopefully more people on treatment today and it'll keep going um, and we all know that and so while we talk a lot about HIV vaccine awareness day um, I think perhaps the most important message is it's not a day. It's not just a day. And, and the search for an HIV vaccine can't be just focused on on May 18th. And I know everyone on this call knows it. And that's really, for us, the guiding message and the guiding uh, importance of going forward. And I just do want to end with a, um, just to, to, to say something that w w is not at all new because it was said 20 years ago today. Um, and, and it could, but it could have been said today. Um, we're grateful that new and effective anti-HIV strategies are available in bringing longer and better lives to those who are infected, but we dare not be complacent. HIV is capable of mutating, becoming resistant to therapies, and could well become even more dangerous. Only a truly effective preventive HIV vaccine can limit and eventually eliminate the threat of HIV and AIDS. And, and that was said by Bill Clinton in his commencement address on May 18, 1997. It could have been said by any world leader in any country, any community advocate, any trial participant, any researcher on May 18, 2017. Um, and it is no less important um, today, I would argue, in fact, it's more important today than ever. Um, and the great news is that there is a growing uh, community doing this. So MHRP and the VRC and the IAVIs and the HVTNs and the NIADs and the VARGs and um, community advocates all over. And we just want to take a moment to thank everybody for that recommitment um, uh, today and always in making sure that eventually we can stop thinking about this day as one of recommitting to still needing an HIV vaccine, but rather a day where we talk about the rollout of a safe, effective, affordable, efficacious vaccine um, to all in need. Um, aspirational though it is, um, that is um, uh, that, that is what, uh, that is what we, we need to be doing. So, Julie, thank you. Thank you all at the MHRP um, for, for an incredible team effort, um, uh, not just on the webinar, but in all the work that you all do. Um, I really want to thank Stacey and the whole team at AVAC for not just these five webinars and all of these materials, uh, uh, but for um, really pulling together um, uh, resources that hopefully um, we all will be using um, until we get an HIV vaccine. Um, 
So stay tuned for many more webinars and conversations, not only about HIV vaccines, but about HIV prevention, treatment, and cure. And, and I think it was great, Julie, as you described how comprehensive it all must be. Um, and that is certainly the approach we take uh, at AVAC and look forward to all of that uh, um, working with everyone going forward. So thank you so very much and um, looking forward to um, many more opportunities.